Thank you for listening to the Maker in the Mix podcast, where we discuss design, innovation, and all things concrete. So, you know, the other thing that I do want to touch on at some point is that, you know, if you're making, it's like this this kind of trend that I've noticed of um, going back to going back to full thickness pours. Um, and, you know, if you're making an inch and a half thick solid countertop or a two inch thick solid countertop, because it's easier to pour. And I get that. I mean, I used to, when I did precast, you know, conventional early on before I came to CCI, I mean, I was pouring, you know, 2000 pound kitchen islands and sure the, the, the cast took 30 minutes and the form took 30 minutes. So it was a lot faster, but there's, I mean, what are you, what are you going to do to transport? You know, it's, it's that, that was the, the, the hiccup for me was a, it was fragile, right? So, you know, that's being taken up by people who are doing sort of a GFRC, uh, at full thickness because you've got some reinforcement in there, but it's also extremely heavy. So, you know, my personal preference on that is to, you know, I, I do like to direct cast, but I'll take the extra time and build an inner form so that my pieces are still in the three quarter of an inch range. So anyway, that's a really good point. I got a picture that that um, from a class a long time ago where it's just a kitchen countertop that has a sinkhole in it. Right. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. it's like eight or eight or nine feet long, but it's mm-hmm. probably three inches thick. Yeah. And it's a photo of two people holding it up casually Mm -hmm. just lifting it off the cart casually Mm -hmm. and it's foam core right so it's a it's there there are advantages of working with a material that you don't have to cast solid yeah exactly um welcome to the maker in the mix episode 29 we're almost to the big 3-0 um and uh jeff and i've just been talking about um GFRC, the acronym, what does it mean? What did it mean? You know, we, we saw a couple of questions on Facebook groups, you know, UHPC versus GFRC. And, um, you know, we also recognized, uh, uh, Jeff was telling me, you know, a minute ago that we have this kind of preconceived notion of what GFRC is because of what GFRC was. And, and the reality is we're honestly working with the new GFRC, if you will. Yeah. So we wanted to expound on that a little bit, um, you know, industry trends and the materials we're working with, these um, these materials uh, just being far and away better, you know, because they are an improvement on the science of, of GFRC. And so we wanted to, you know, use this podcast to expound on the new, the new craft concrete. So, yeah. Take it well, away, Good Jeff. morning, everybody. So, you know, we're dealing with an alphabet soup of letters here. We've got, you know, GFRC and ECC and UHPC and all that. And what the heck does it mean? And does it matter? Um, and that's kind of what I want to talk talk about is let, let's. First, let's define what those are, because I remember, like Caleb said, the first time he came to class, he's like, I didn't even know what GFRC stood for. <laughs> and I was afraid to Probably ask because everybody joke, else knew what it was. was. <laughs> so GFRC, you know, stands for Glass Fiber Reinforced Concrete. So, you know, if you step back and you, you step back far enough, you could go, OK, does that mean any concrete that has glass fibers in it is GFRC? And you could, you know, be really technical and, and all that and say, yes. But well, I think some people probably step back and said, if it has fibers in it at all, it's, you know, they're calling it GFRC. Yeah. Well, which, no, it's, it's got to be glass. It's got to be glass. Right. Because there's a lot of other kinds of fibers out there in the world. But l- let's just simplify things and, and streamline this and make it, you know, kind of like everyday. Let's work with everyday concepts, everyday. We don't want to get too technical, too nitpicky here. Although I am going to be strictly um, accurate in terms of, describing things i'm not going to make up new concepts and new rules just to you know suit my narrative these are just you know i'm working with basic principles here um the kind of gfrc that we kind of all have in our heads is a you know it's a fine sand roughly or usually equal parts sand cement um got a lot of glass fibers in it it's got you know sticky polymer in it and you know as we a lot of people have either learned from or seen 
you spray some of it with with a hopper gun into your forms, or you might be <clears throat> pouring or hand placing a thicker face coat into your forms, and then you mix up the fibers into the into the, another batch, and then that that thicker you know sticky mashed potato kind of consistency is is spread and then compacted with a roller that that concept right mm-hmm. that's what we all think about GFRC because that's really how traditional right we as artisans have adapted that material to our needs mm-hmm. so again going back i've said this before and i'm probably going to say it again GFRC is sort of a system developed in the late 60s early 70s started in the UK um for making you know very efficient architectural pieces like mm-hmm. the outside of the building panels so you might have a building facade panel that might be you know 10 15 feet wide 10 15 20 feet tall and it's got all the architectural details the window details door details corner details all that built into it mm-hmm. and that big panel is relatively thin so it might be three quarters of an inch to an inch thick. And in commercial GFRC facade panels, those are all bonded to a structural steel frame. And we, we don't deal with that, but all we've done is we've, we're working with the, basically the same mix they're, they're doing. Mm-hmm. So the reason why GFRC was created was uh, as bigger and bigger buildings were going up and they needed to make bigger buildings or more buildings more economically, precast concrete panels you know, thick four, six inch thick panels that form the outside of the buildings or brick and real brick and real stone, they were really expensive and it took a long time. So you had a lot of different trades involved, took a long time because these products are heavy. Um, The heavier the outside of a building, the more expensive it is because you have to have a a bigger foundation, maybe has to go deeper, maybe you have to do more foundational work, very, very expensive. So having a light curtain wall, a facade, uh, all relatively light, right? Mm-hmm. Made it very economical. And now you can make the whole thing in one place very quickly. Um, so it, it made everything economical. All right. So that's sort of the background. And what we as artisans did, this kind of started, we'll call it 2005, 2006, 2007. That has percolated into our little very early, very young growing industry because there are a lot of advantages and let's contrast to where we were coming from was more conventional concrete stuff that had rocks in it. Usually um, cast solid inch and a half, two inches, three inches, four inches thick with steel rebar or steel. You know, I, I was a strong advocate and promoted using uh, structural steel ladder wire used in masonry because it is structural wire, uh, just the right scale, the right size of things. Um, but you're still casting things solid. And so now everything was heavy. You know, the casting process, if, especially if you're dealing with a very fluid, self-consolidating wet cast mix, uh, it still needed steel reinforcing um, because the, the basic material properties, which I want to touch on, and this is why we moved into fiber reinforced concretes, was um, regular concrete is very, very brittle. and I'll by itself, unreinforced concrete. Very, very brittle. You can bear where's my ruler? Gotta get my ruler. <laughs> gotta get the I ruler. Get, see, I got a, I got I got another one. I got a bigger one. Because I don't know where the other one is. Um do these rulers just live on your desk? Yes, they do. <laughs> I have tons of crap on my desk. Me too. Um, don't look at it. Multiple mice, uh pens, pencils, you name it. Like so are they do you, do they have names? Are they pet mice? No. No. This one's my favorite one. <laughs> This I is my laptop you, George. House for traveling. Um, good, good thing it's not it, rats. Any t- if if you ever and Caleb, you can like when you first started your business or when you bought that business, you were making unreinforced wet cast concrete. That uh, any any kind of deflection, you pick up one end from one gone, done. it's gone. It shatters. It breaks. I mean, and, I really wish I was exaggerating when I said that I for. Had to be a year. I broke every every third piece I make. Yeah, and and, and I mean it was oh it was horrible. I had to remake you, so much. Couple that with the 
the very widespread misunderstanding of how reinforcing worked. I mean, I've seen people put it in the middle. Of, Don't do that. Yeah, put it in the middle, or you know, wrap wrap your sinkholes with a with a ring of rebar, and that's good enough. And all these things, it's like it's because how reinforcing work is not taught to to people other right. than civil engineers. Right. So there's a natural, it's perfectly reasonable, perfectly understandable, and I'm not going to go into that. Right. So what made GFRC so exciting to so many people was now you didn't have to use rebar. In fact, you, you shouldn't not steal. And there's other reasons I'm not going to get into it now. Um, but you could make your pieces lighter because you didn't have to make them a solid two inches thick. You could make a three quarter inch thick shell, maybe make the, the edges, you know, a little bit thicker horizontally. Mm -hmm. vertically they could be whatever height you wanted to and mm -hmm. now you could make something that looked like an eight a six inch thick slab weigh a, a you know just enough or light enough so that two people could pick it up whereas before you needed a forklift to pick it up yeah i mean yesterday i installed um series of a couple of bathroom vanities and they um they're floating mm -hmm. uh the smaller of the two is 36 inches wide and 16 inches thick and it, wow. um, and, and it contained a 10 inch tall drawer in it. Um, and you know, couldn't have, couldn't have done that. I mean, you could have, I suppose, but how in the world would you have hung it? You know, right. what kind of bracketry would you have needed to, I mean, cause it would have needed to be minimum of two, two inches thick. Uh, and you know, and then you've yeah. got all that hydrostatic pressure to deal with in the form. I mean, it would have been a nightmare. Right. Right. Um, just, just the handling of something. I remember yeah. the very first time I made a, I made a ramp sink back. 2007. Not that ramp sinks were new back then. They were relatively new, but now everybody makes one. But like a, I was doing a, a test cast of this, and, and this is just before, that was actually before I learned how to do GFRC, because I learned how to do GFRC in June of 2008. And I just found a picture of me being taught how to do it. Hmm. And so I cast this solid block of concrete. You know, it's basically. 18 inches on a side by about six inches thick. And it was essentially solid except for the sink. Can mm. you, we call it the boat anchor because <laughs> it, it weighed like 300 it? pounds. It was not, it wasn't 300 pounds, but it weighed a lot. Like two people struggled to move it. Yeah. Um, mostly because it was hard to pick up, but it was heavy, right? That's ridiculous. And yet you make one out of a thin shell and now it's, you know, 40, 50 pounds. Oh, and I know. Yeah. I've sent it up and slide it up. Vanities to places. And, you know, it's like a six foot vanity. It'll be 80 pounds. Right. It's like, well, so yeah. that was the big attraction for switching to GFRC was because now your pieces were a lot lighter. So you can make bigger pieces and still be able to handle them mm -hmm. um, because it had such a high fiber content. They were much more um, flexible and more robust. So they're far less, they were not brittle. So you could flex a little bit. And I have a photo to show what I mean by that flexibility. And, um, you know, so if you did things right, every piece you made was good. And, you know, another advantage of GFRC is with the conventional casting where you're spraying a mist coat, or a lot of people call it a face coat, um, you separated the aesthetic part. Like I call it the money part, the part your customer sees and is paying for versus from the structural part. So you could really focus on getting that good. And then when you put your structural part, as long as you did it right, and that's one of the detriments of this process is everything worked out great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But because you're doing two things in two separate stages, spraying your mist coat, has to you have to wait for it to tack up a little bit, get thick enough, can't oh, be too thick. You know. Could could dry out, or you get sand blowback on it, and it was a slow process. So there were a lot of downsides, and I'm not saying that GFRC is perfect. GFRC is the concept, not as what the letters stand for. Um, and so there's there's still this sort of hangover of this is what GFRC is. Right. And I'm going to share my screen real quick just to show a couple pictures of that. Um, just for s some folks who are not that familiar with it. Um, okay. It's going to get, you're going to have recursive. So, you know, this is, there it goes. this is a spraying, you know, 
you're using a hopper gun. You're, this I'm actually spraying my kitchen countertops. Um, and then there's also the hand layup. Hang on. Side of things. I think I know all of the people in that picture. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, this is what I mean by, okay, there's your mist coat. And then now you're having to put your backer on this. This happens to be a... I think it's a planter or something. I don't know what it is. It yeah, doesn't really it matter. Have a bottom, you're, so that's you're spreading this material up the wall. So mm -hmm. it's a process that you have to be really careful about. You have to be conscious of getting this to be the right consistency. Well, this, and, and we've talked in previous weeks about fibers and the Owens Corning fibers being a lot stiffer. They they scratch face coats really easily. Yeah, yeah. They just have that problem. They don't. They're not conducive to this because they'll mm -hmm. dig in because they're very very stiff. Mm -hmm. um, they're great fibers, but. Mm -hmm they're not ideal for this and they poke through your gloves and yeah. Um, so this is the concept that a lot of people still have of this is GFRC when that is a way of casting. Right. And I'm going to get, get back to you guys. All right. So let's switch to UHPC. Ultra UHPC high stands for concrete. ultra high performance concrete. And it's a definition, it's a somewhat loose definition that's kind of a little bit different, depends on where you are in the world. Canadians have a definition that's a little bit different from the U.S. Uh, the Europeans have something that's a little different. Indians and South Asians have slightly different definitions. But if you kind of all amalgamate them together, they're essentially defining UHPC as a very, very high compressive strength concrete that happens to have certain other characteristics. And those other characteristics are a byproduct of the makeup of the concrete, but they all share similar characteristics. And these, that is uh, very fine sands, no large aggregate, um, low water cement ratios, high pozzolan content, usually silica fume, but not always. And the, the, Singular defining characteristic that's common is the compressive strengths typically are at or above 22,000 psi or 150 MPA. 150 MPA is 21,750, call it 22,000 psi. So very, very high compressive strengths. Typically, and that's do all they? Very well impressive, you know, compared to conventional concrete that you might pour you know, a driveway out of, or you might pour your foundation wall, might be three, maybe 4,000 PSI. So 3,000 PSI is 20 MPA. So we're talking about something that's seven and a half times stronger in compression. Okay, and this is where I'm going to kind of step back and and step away from the alphabet soup of, of those letters. But just re remember, GFRC is, um, you know, basically optimized to create a high flexural strength concrete. Right. We don't really care about the compressive strength. It's a high compressive strength, don't get me wrong. It's just we don't really need to focus on what that is. UHPC is a very high compressive strength concrete that when you use the right kind of fibers and the right amount, you get a high flexural strength. But that being a byproduct. But that's a, that's a secondary byproduct. That's not, not what it's made for. Well, and, and don't they... Um... That doesn't and, mean you can't use it, but you have to use the right fibers and but and you have to cure it right. Right. It, the curing is an, a big element. And there's a technical paper that I'm not going to like bore you with the details, but the different ways of curing UHPC under rigorous laboratory tests clearly show that if you don't cure it right, you lose massive amounts of strength. And that's why we go on and on about curing correctly. And that's more than just covering plastic overnight. Okay. Um, so now I know just to interject here. Um, I'm on a roll. So you interrupt me when you, whenever just, you need to. Just gonna punch I'm in my in. lecture mode. <laughs> I'm just going to punch in here. Um, raise my hand in class. Uh, yeah. No, but um, I don't want this to seem like that, but it, it's going to come across that way. I apologize. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. <laughs> I'm here to, I'm here to just throw a wrench in it. Um, so I remember, you know, Back in the, this is probably seven or eight years ago, maybe five or six years ago, um, a, a UHPC mix came out um, 
that is now being used commercially on highway bridges and things like that because I believe it was sold. Um, but it used steel fibers. Um, mm -hmm. And that, if I'm not mistaken, because, you know, UHPC, typically you got to, you know, and I'm sure you'll go into this, but you have to mix it for a very, very long time because of its extremely low water content, extremely high plasticizer content. Um, and then you have to use steel fibers, or at least in some mixes you do. Um, and so, you know, it has to be cast solid, realistically. Um, it, yeah, remember, it's it's just just although it's 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 a very very carefully tailored you just don't grab go to home depot and buy whatever bag of sand that you want and throw it in the mix and say it's uhpc although with so what you're saying is uhpc has a very specific definition and you can't just call something uhpc for fun right right cool. and and that's just not jeff gerard saying that just that's like Lots and lots of technical papers that anybody can get on the internet if you Google UHPC. It's out there. Um, here's the ACI. It's a technical report, ultra high performance concrete emerging technology technology report, uh, written in what's the date of Which this? UHPC was emitted in France, correct? The concept, yeah, and ductile, which is the commercial um, product. Lafarge, was the first right? like commercial bagged geo yeah uh uhpc mix and i actually have a ductile like technical data product data sheet let me share the screen so i don't have to like wave my hands and, and describe it i'm going to do a lot of this today folks so just bear with me well i mean you can get bored by technical papers if you want to but i think um all right where am i i'm Jeff lost and i nerd out on it but i think there's a woo. Sorry. <laughs> I got lost. Hold on. <laughs> uh, Damn it. But I, I think we nerd out on here it we because go. the proof is in the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, here right? we go. Sorry. Um, I got lots of tabs open and crap like that. I have a lot to, lot to show you. But this is like the, the ductile. Can you see this, Caleb? Yes, I can. Yeah. So the, I, I just pulled this up offline. And, you know, UHPC, all that. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And the point of this is um, low water cement ratio, you know, below 0.25. Now, th that's not a rule. Sometimes it's below 0.27, sometimes below 0.20. I've seen mix designs that use a water cement ratio of 0.15, incredibly low, right? Um, right here, steel fibers, okay? Not glass fibers, not PVA fibers, steel fibers. Now, there are some UHPC mixes that do use PVA fibers that are known to, that are basically used for architectural reasons, like what we do. Um, they have a lower compressive strength and a lower flexural strength. Um, so it's, it's a subset of UHPC. Again, this is not a strict definition. <clears throat> I'm just showing you what the cloud of concept is. And here's your compressive strength, right? Greater okay. than two. interesting, by the way, the flow seven to ten inches. So yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's <clears throat> fascinating. Given the flow conversation yeah. we had last that's, week, that's that's a flow test right there. That that little cone that I showed the other day. That's what that that's what creates that. Now it happens to be on the machine that they don't turn the crank to make that go up and down. Right. Um, that's a different test. But um, yeah, seven to ten inches. And all the like a lot of the samples that I made, even with high fiber contents, have flows of greater than seven inches, usually around eight inches, which what I consider moderate flow. And I showed you a 10 inch flow uh, last week that I would consider a high flow. Mm -hmm. All right. So here's, you know, your compressive strength. KSI is just K is kilo, like thousand. So it just means thousand PSI. So 21,000, 22,000 PSI at 28 days. And they also show that this particular product, when cured correctly, um, for greater than 14,000 PSI at four days. So very high compressive strength, remember that. Compressive strength. Nowhere on here is flexural strength. Well, and again, I, I, I think, you know, I started to mention it, but like the reason that we love these types of things is that, you know, it's like, um, 
I, I'll use a I'll use a religious example here. When um when the printing press was invented and they started printing Bibles in English, it was no longer you know it was no longer like you had to go to mass and listen to the priest say it and believe that he was telling you the truth. You could go read it for yourself. Um, and I think this is the same kind of concept. It's like, you know, CCI doesn't exist to preach at you and tell you what's right. And you have to believe it because we say it's right. You know, mm -hmm. we're going to, we're going to sit here and show you where we've gotten the information and then tell you how to go get it yourself. Because, you know, I, in fact, somebody posted something about a bathtub thickness, wall thickness. Um, and I said, you know, something that, to the, because the customer uh, was like, well, how do I know I'm it's back. not going to fail or crack or whatever? And my response was, well, if you make it right, it won't matter. But, you know, here are some tips. Here was my first bathtub, which, by the way, I made in 2015. Um, it was a lounge chair bathtub. I can, you know, I could pull it up, but it would take, I don't have it pulled up like Jeff does. I don't have all the tabs open because I wasn't planning on talking about it. But, um, you know, it was three quarters of an inch thick. And I, co I consulted with Jeff at that time, you know, to make sure that I could make it that thin and have it withstand the pressures that it, and it was a very funky shape, so it didn't have to be super thick. Um, you know, point being, we're not just going to say, oh, it'll be fine. It's let's verify that with math, you know, look into the numbers, test it for yourself. Um, and, and that's the, the general, you know, we, we all Modus work with we all of, work with different kinds of concrete, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the the point of this talk is to kind of shed some light on what are some of the differences and what's relevant and what should you use and does it make a difference and all that. And that's hopefully by the time you're done listening to this, you have a better understanding. And there's just a lot of little concepts that are that all feed together that we're covering a lot of different things in the beginning. So just bear with us. But so the when I described the concept of GFRC earlier, that has evolved to, like, I can only speak, and I'm only going to speak about stuff CCI has, and especially the new alpha products. Um, I've worked with a lot of other people's GFRC. I've worked with a lot of from scratch mixes. I've made GFRC in New Zealand, Australia, Singapore. Um, Cayman Islands. Cayman Islands, Canada. Uh, India, um, Finland, um, all over the place, England, definitely. And so the materials and all that are different in the, in the, the, but the basic principles of the mix, mix designs and things like that still hold true. What all of those instances had in common was they had similar mix designs and they still kind of fell under the umbrella of the commercial GFRC type mixes, the hand layup and all that. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, and people certainly have done very successful things with that. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just what has changed and what people are kind of, what's old is new again, right? Mm -hmm. Because I got started so long ago, there was no GFRC. Everything was, you either packed it solid a la Buddy Rhodes, or you poured it fluid a la Chang. Those are the two styles. You did stiff hand pack, all sand mix, or you did a fluid conventional aggregate based mix. Those are your choices. Mm -hmm. Now we, I see a lot of people moving towards kind of a hybrid casting or SEC and things like that. And, and there's there's a lot makes a lot of sense for a lot of things because uh some shapes are just too difficult to do a spray layup like that couch we did getting into a tall narrow section you know i can't reach the bottom of the form because my arms aren't too aren't long enough and mm -hmm. the the space between the two walls is so narrow there's no way i can get down there to cast it properly so we have to do something different mm -hmm. um and and building a mold and pouring concrete and filling it solid is extremely efficient from a labor standpoint. But sometimes it doesn't make sense if you're trying to make something really, really big. I got this island I got to make. It's 10 feet long and six feet wide and, and the client wants it to look two inches thick. So 
sure, it's super simple just to cast it two inches thick, but that that monster, how heavy is that, right? No, does it really you. make sense from a handling standpoint to make something that big solid just because it's easy? Like you have to think more than just what is. Well, and again, I've been seeing, I mean, I've been seeing there people posting videos of them casting and all this stuff. And I'm like, why are you making it solid? You don't have to, unless maybe they're using a mix where you get incredible fluidity, but you need the, the extra thickness to actually gain some strength. Yeah. I don't know. Or um, they just don't know how to do it any other way. And it's like, okay, I, I, I watched a couple of YouTube videos and that's what people do. But and just, that's kind of yeah. the, the, um, the, the steep learning curve of the, the of this craft is there's a lot there are a lot of simple things you can do but sometimes they don't make sense in the big picture because as a, you know as a business, you want right? to make that giant island and wow I didn't think how heavy it was going to be and now I need like fifteen people to pick it up well if you're like I don't me have 15 people yeah if you're like me you see things on a set of plans right and you're like oh you know fifteen feet no big deal and then you make it and you're like ugh that is bigger in real life than I sort of yeah. thought it would be in my head. Right. Um, you know, and so like, wanna, I don't want to, I don't want to go there, but that's, that's like, that's a facet of mm -hmm. things you should be considering. You think about, right. Yeah. Um, well, but my, my point was, you know, there's, there's this, and then the, there's the concept too of let's say for the sake of argument that you're using a, um, you know, a, ad mix or a blended mix and you know these if you're if you're using a good one they're not overly cheap you know you, you pay for what you you know you get what you pay for ideally and um and so you've chosen like the good business person that you are to do use a quality mix design but if you're using gfrc and you're using a quality mix design and it's not inexpensive um, and you're casting it solid, which you don't technically need to do, then in theory, you're wasting mm -hmm. two, a lot of three money. times the material you need to use uh, yeah. just because it's easy. Um, and But then you flip it over and it's no longer easy. Well, it was easy to cast, but was is it easy to put in? Do you need to pay five extra people for a day? You know, that's several hundred dollars, if not more. Mm -hmm to um you know for a few hours to get them onto the site and then you got to buy their lunch and you got to transport you know you like there's just so many factors to doing these extremely heavy pieces that you know I certainly don't have to deal with anymore because I chose you know I choose the extra form work over the thick pieces mm -hmm. and that's that's again the difference between folks who are learning this craft and getting into it and kind of figuring out learning this on their own or not being taught by people who should be, do, be teaching that. And then, you know, folks who have been doing this for a long time, who have the experience to understand that there's, every, there's context to everything. And yeah, I um, mean, you know, the, if you're, you gotta if you're, about things. if you're teaching this and, and your experience is, you know, I've done 15, 20 years of, of this, but I, it's mostly small things. Um, you know, whereas, Maybe I've only been doing it for 10 years, but it's mostly big, big things. So my experience is going to inform how I teach you to do this. And Jeff, you know, from the engineering background, and he also did big things and he did heavy things and he did GFRC. And so there's a there's 20 years of a lot of experience there that, that you know, is being drawn upon. So, you know, it's it's I don't want to be a one trick pony teaching you how to do the one trick. I want to teach you how to learn your own tricks. And, so, and that's so let's kind go of... back to the original question is, which do I pick? Right. Right. So I, I'm not going to answer that question yet because I want to feed more, feed you more information um, so that you have a better understanding. The, the, what I, Jeff Gerard, and CCI call GFRC is not the same thing as commercial GFRC that uses liquid polymers and you're spraying up could be like i could turn what i use into that if i well and again to. we've taught four ton based traditional yeah. gfrc over the years yeah. absolutely and 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 just just to show that you could take a commercial gfrc mix and do that again i'm going to share my screen for a second but i want to pull up the document first to make sure that i know what i'm doing there it is there's my tech note okay share my screen our screen. 
Boom. So G- GRCA is the Glass Fiber Reinforced Concrete Association out of the UK, right? That's the governing body for commercial GFRC in the UK, just like the Precast Concrete Institute, PCI, PCI is in the United States. They're basically cousins. They spell things differently. They use different units, but it's exactly the same thing. Kalur. So here's a, a tech note. You can go to their website and download this. That's where I got it. So self-compacting premix GRC. So they call G- GFRC GRC. Um, self-compacting SCC um, is basically where you take and pour backer that's highly fluid into a mold. You vibrate it and you get high Excellent detail. surface quality. Excellent surface quality. So this document came out in 2010. Okay. I'm going to show you a video. Where is it? Of me cast. So this is what we're ca- we cast in class. It's a little orchid table I made for our kitchen. It doesn't sit there anymore, but it's essentially, you know, it's one inch thick. It's 45 inches long, nine inches wide. Forget the height. Doesn't matter. Right. Looks like so, about 36. 30, about 30. I think it's 30 inches tall. Sure. Whatever. It's cool. I like the holes. It's cool. One inch thick. It's got these holes in it. And the way I cast it, this is all direct cast GFRC. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Okay, here we go. So this is casting in class. And so the form's laying on its on its edge, and we're casting from the backside, and that is a conventional that is some lovely fluid concrete, Jeff. Fluid three percent load of fibers, and this is kind of where a three, high fiber content kind of breaks down. Is... Did you use Lexan as the back form? Yep. So That's I could see what I'm awesome. doing. All right. So we could watch what we were doing. Ooh, we need to do that again. That's fun. Uh, came out beautiful. Were there some voids? Sure. But Didn't that's just because, you know, trap bubbles around the, the big air pockets. Um, around the, around the, um, phone around the, the, the block outs. Yeah. So making a very fluid conventional GFRC mix. And that would have been using Forton, yes. What's that? That would have been using Forton, yes. That was using Forton, right? Um, you could do it. Was it great? Eh, it worked. What's so exciting about UHPC as a concept is the overall material properties are better. Mm-hmm. So as you know, I've done a lot of flexural testing over the last year and a half. We'd already talked about that. I have tested that exact same mix design that you just saw me pour four ton three you know five percent four ton polymer solid three percent 19 millimeter fibers all that i've tested that gotten the flexural strengths and they're they're good right they're good but take a slightly different concrete mix with alpha polymer and i get better and i get really, really good numbers really quickly. So I can get one day strengths that are roughly equivalent to that mix at seven days. So I just accelerated everything by a week. Um, And my 28 day strengths are higher too. Although again, we don't really care about 28 day strengths. Bear in mind, UHPC as a concept out in the real world, everything is measured at 28 days. Because that's what construction happens at, right? So your 22,000 PSI is at 28 days when it's cured in a human environment for 28 days. So the the numbers that this material can, the potential it can reach, that it can give you, are it's tied predicated to on a very specific cure. Very specific curing schedules that none of us none of us do because we can't right because when when you know we in our ex- specific craft concrete industry when we say good curing practices what we mean is you know curing it under 
uh, tarp and blankets, right? Plastic and blankets for 24 hours, ideally, but 12 hours uh, or so, 12, 16, 18 hours, um, and and flipping it and then wet processing it, so forth and so so on. But that's predicated on a curing polymer. If you don't have a curing polymer, then that time needs to be dramatically increased, which can increase your risk of ghosting and all of those things. Because you know, no matter what you hear, mm -hmm. if you don't have a curing polymer and you're not like if you're picking and choosing how you cure based on what you feel like, then you know you're not going to be getting the numbers that you think you're getting. So you know, it may be that you get halfway decent concrete but you could get phenomenal concrete if you cured it the right way right. which you know so like i said if you don't if you don't have a curing polymer then you might need to cure it for seven days in, concrete, in a, in a no way no matter what no matter what the concrete mix design is no matter what letters are associated with it concrete doesn't care what you think doesn't care what you feel doesn't care what i say it Facts does it don't care thing. about your feelings no it's our job to understand it. It doesn't care about us. So if we don't understand how it needs to be cast, how it needs to be cured, how it needs to be handled, it's going to tell us. And it's going to tell us by doing something we don't want. Yeah. It I could mean, curl, it could break, it could crack, it could do shatter. whatever. Yeah. Let me, um, Go, go ahead. You were going to say something. Well, I was going to say, um, you know, if you're not, because that's the other thing is, and, and I'm not going to get into fibers because we've had like three podcasts on that. But if you're using, you know, different kinds of fibers, if you're not using glass, you're using PVA because you think they're as strong because a lot of, I mean, I thought they were as strong. I thought that it was just a direct replacement. And they were just a different technology. Um, you know, the chemistries reacted differently, whatever. Right. But then, you know, we start, Jeff starts doing testing and we're like, Ooh, that's not at all what we thought it was and then i see you know a failure of of where well you know something was being flipped <laughs> and it was not attached properly to the forklift mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be and believe me i've done that i feel that pain um but then the next picture is is something in six pieces on the floor and i thought i i saw that and i'm like it's not gfrc or if it is it's not reinforced properly it's not enough gfrc uh, it's, an, you know, because I did a, a 16 foot table, right? It's a three inches thick, two and a half inches thick, something like that. It was less than four, more than two. Don't remember. That exactly. It was yeah, exactly that, that much. It was exactly that much. Yeah. Um, and it was foam core. It was a 16 foot long, four foot wide conference table, foam mm -hmm. core. Um, and it had scrim in it on the bottom because it had a, a decent span. And I was flipping it. And if you remember, Jeff, in my old shop, I had these poles. I had a lot of, oh, I had a yeah. lot of structural poles in the middle of my shop. It made the shop phenomenally difficult to navigate because it was like three separate shops, kind of almost, even though it was one big room, but it was all separated by poles. And so anyway, my casting tables were in the center section. And so to get mm -hmm. it out where I could polish it, you know, I had it vertical in the air on fork straps and the cl I had clamps kind of holding the straps in place or whatever. I tilted the forklift wrong. I was trying to flip it forwards like an idiot. And it just did a somersault off the forklift, six feet in the air, hit the cart, fell over, flipped, hit the ground. I mean, I had lumps all over the floor. It was horrible. The piece did not break. In fact, the bottom where the reinforcement was didn't even crack. The, the top face cracked. I had stru I had um, non-structural visual cracking. The face coat cracked. The face coat cracked, but the piece did not structurally yeah. fail in any way, shape, or form. In fact, the next class, which was a couple of weeks later, we sealed that piece. Mm -hmm. um, and it looked really cool. I've got pictures somewhere. But point being, GFR, good quality, well-made GFRC that is reinforced the right, right way should not shatter. Right. Ever. I got I got lot, some anyway. photos and I got a couple of videos that'll tie into this because I want I want people to see like a lot of what we've been talking about is just standing here talking and waving your hands. Right. And, you know, although I like to come from a place of um, uh, integrity and, and honesty and truthfulness, because that's kind of what I 
that's what this little diploma is. That's what this ring is. Yeah, you know, he sent me a video about the ring the other day. Yeah, which was um, cool. it's it's my obligation to my profession and to to you, my you know my customers, is to be honest and 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 ha hold high integrity and, and be professional. So I'm not going to like blow smoke up your butt because I I want you to believe what I think you should believe. Um, well, the, the point here is we're, I don't think we're trying to craft a narrative. We're trying to show you what the narrative is based on facts, right? Right. We're peeling back the, the curtain, like exposing the wizard kind of thing. Well, this is what the wizard studies, right? And I, again, I don't want to make this overly complicated. I don't want you to think you have to know all this, but I'm just trying to paint the pictures that when if you if you can see a broader field of what's going on and how things fit together, you're able to make better decisions for yourself, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's the important thing. So what you are making, the, the physical thing you're making is going to really help shape the decisions you're going to be making in terms of, well, which of these two mixes should I use? Well, the, the, the one answer is you don't have to choose, right? But I don't want people to think that all GFRC is bad and old fashioned because somebody's pushing a narrative that wants you to believe that you, you can make some fantastic things with GFRC, but there are some limitations that choosing say a, a well-designed and well-made and well-cured UHPC mix can give you, you can get a lot more benefits. There are some downsides to it too. So it's all about understanding. And, and here's where I'm going to kind of stray away from the concrete and talk about the shapes and how the behaviors influence that decision. All right. So let's go back to fundamentals and talk about what's the difference between compression, compressive strength and flexural strength. I'm going to share my screen again. I'm, I'm in uh, lecture mode again. Presentation right. mode, Jeff. Presentation mode. All right, so well, we're, we're, we get excited about these kinds of things. We, get we want to show you, like, we want you to see where the where the rubber so, meets the road, when, right? When you talk about compressive strength, oh my, I have three thousand psi concrete. I have twenty two thousand psi. By the concrete. way, do you make test cubes? No, didn't think so. No, sorry. Just Ultimately, I will that. just to be able to, you know have literature say that I've checked that box and I achieved this insanely high compressive strength. Does it matter? No. Um, flexural strength is all that matters to me. So if I'm focusing on, this is compressive strength. This is, this is a, a concrete cylinder that's being crushed in a machine, a test machine. And this is a, the, an exciting point of failure. So this concrete is crushing, right? So in conventional concrete, mix design, uh, this is all that matters, your compressive strength, your 3,000 PSI, your 4,000 PSI, your 20 MPA, 30 MPA, 150 MPA. This is what is, is happening. Mm -hmm. Concrete's not bending. Concrete's not being stretched. It's being put it's into being crushed. extreme compression. Okay. You will never, ever see any concrete you make fail this way. If you do. I don't know. If you do, you're doing what you're making. Wrong, right. So the reason why compressive strength is focused on so much is because in reinforced concrete design. Oh, wrong wrong picture. Do 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 do. Do I have it here or do I have it here? Um Sorry. Go back to this. Um, well, okay. I'll, yeah, I'll, all right. Here, yeah. we, here we go. Okay. So the reason is we use steel rebar. And then a lot of us use either basalt or fiberglass rebar. But we use tensile members where all the tension that's built up in a structure is taken by a separate material that's not the concrete. So whether we're making a column or we're making a beam or doing a wall, we put rebar in it. Mm -hmm. That rebar is largely, it's not always, sometimes it's shear reinforcing and there is compression reinforcing, but 
largely it's made for tensile elements. Mm -hmm. It's tensile reinforcement. So the concrete only has to do the compressive thing. It doesn't need to do the tension. And here, this is another diagram. And if you guys have my textbook, you see this. This is a drawing that I made a long time ago. If you have a chunk of concrete, a slab, and you pick it up from each end, it now turns into a beam, whether you want it to or not. And when you pick it up and it flexes because gravity pulls on it, it's going to shrink at the top and stretch out at the bottom. That's how, whether it's made out of rubber or plastic or wood or concrete or steel or granite or whatever, everything in the universe flexes to some degree. And if something flexes where you get tension built up, it's being stretched out. And this is where concrete fails. This is why concrete needs steel reinforcing because the steel reinforcing is placed where the tension's the maximum. It's placed mm -hmm. down here. This dashed line is called the neutral axis. And it, the location of the neutral axis is dependent on the cross-sectional shape of that concrete. And if that concrete is like a plain rectangle, so it's you know, flat top, straight sides, just a big rectangle, that neutral axis is dead center. And the neutral axis is defined as the point where there is no compression and there is no tension. So if you put all your reinforcing where this dashed line is, because that's where somebody told you, you looked at somebody pouring a, a floor and they saw that their rebar was in the middle uh -huh. and you put it there and you made a beam, what's holding this thing together? Nothing. Only the concrete itself. And if you're making an unreinforced concrete, is very, very, very weak in tension, mm -hmm. which is why we use fibers. Well, if you use enough of the right fibers and your mix design can handle that high volume of fibers, you don't need extra tensile reinforcement because your fibers are doing that job. And to show you what that can do is, did I put it in here or did it? Did I put it over here? Did I put it over here? Oh, futz. <laughs> um, well, here. You know, this is a little bench thing we made in class. It's one inch thick. It's not a big span, right? But it's got a lot of, those are 100 pound bags of sand. That's a, another 100 pound bag of sand. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 700. And then these are 50 pound bags. So there's 800, 950 pounds on that. Okay, that's flexural strength right there. Right, that that top piece you even, might even be able to tell it's it, flexing. It looks a flexed, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's flexed, right? That's just about at the point of failure. But that's what it took. Did you push? Did you push that one all the way to failure? Or did yes, you, yeah. yes, I did. Um, another exciting picture that you might have seen is this is ECC. Um, this is from the 90s. Bendable concrete. People are all excited. Oh, it's bendable concrete. And you see this, this side picture and it looks like, wow, I've got lots of fibers and these are PVA fibers, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of PVA fibers, right? This is not a very workable mix. right? But if you flip that piece over, look at the cracks in it. Look at all those cracks. Like just because your piece of concrete can bend doesn't mean you could actually, your customer is going to accept that. Right. Um, and that's another exciting, you know, test. That's a, that's a real flexural test. Uh, my test machine basically is made this way with the rollers and everything like that. But look at those cracks right there. You see those cracks? Mm -hmm. That's flexuring cracks. And yes, that is a very ductile material, but. And, and it actually could be quite still quite strong when it's cracked, but from a functional standpoint, it, it, that's not something we want. Okay. Um. Well, and and that's I think the danger of locking yourself into a single. Yeah. Or at least um, maybe not locking yourself in, right? Because what I'm defining as locking yourself in is not understanding the um, the material. Um, that looks like right. my old shop. Because if you're um, if you're making um, 
and I don't have a photo of one, but if you're making a, well, here's a, here's a, here's a sink, right? This is old style, like hand layup mm -hmm. doing an integral sink, right? So this is a, a, a sink mold, you know, a form that looks like we're making two inch high walls, whatever, it doesn't matter. And we're basically just covering that with a shell of concrete. It's not very long. It's got edges that, that wrap up. So it's relatively structurally stiff. We don't need to make this very thick, right? So it's probably going to be, I don't know, three quarter inch thick, roughly 19 millimeters thick, which is overkill, but it's, com it's a comfortable thickness. This piece is pretty stiff on its own because it's all folded and everything like that. It doesn't flex. It doesn't need a high flexural strength to do that because of its shape. In contrast, this is a GFRC desk. It's 12 foot long that we made. This was made in 2009. Um, it's not solid. So it's three quarter inch thick with inch and a, it's inch and a half thick edges that basically have an inch and a half beam along one edge and down the other. Mm -hmm. And it's got scrim in it. Um, but as you can see, it's flexing, right? Dave here's picking the whole thing up from one end. It's being supported at the other end. And it's not touching anywhere along that length. It's got a big flex in it, not a single crack in it, right? That, that did not have a single crack in it. So that is what flexural strength is for. Well, and so what I was about to say is that I think, you know, we want, for all of these reasons that we're talking about, we want to obviously as a materials you know, supplier, right? We want to be able to, to provide you materials you can trust, right? But so, you know, we want you to have kind of ultimate trust in the materials you're using. However, that is not at the at the expense of not understanding it, right? right. So uh, in, in, in our workshops, my hope, and I, I think Jeff's hope as well, is that we can teach you to trust any material that you make because you understand it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's like, well, I'm on a deadline, I've got to make all this stuff, and I I have ultimate trust in my ability to work with the material, rather than just the thing in the bag that somebody told me is good or whatever. You yeah. know, I want you to understand how it works and be not tied to one thing, because, like, I feel very confident that based on, you know, the, the education I've received from CCI, my long-term relationship with Jeff, the mentorship I received from Jeff and all of those things, I could go to another country and figure out, well, I don't, they don't have that thing that I use at my, at home. This will work just fine because I understand what it is and what it's doing and all of that. And I could make quality, uh, quality GFRC, quality concrete for a client in another country with different materials. And I could trust because I understand it. I can mm -hmm. trust that that material was going to provide me the adequate results and the, the satisfactory results that I expect of it because I know what to use and I know what those things are doing. And, there's and another, I'm not tied to. There's another big advantage yeah. that's, that, that builds on that, right? It, 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 certainly what you said is 100% valid and super important for everybody doing this is if you don't really understand what's going on, you really can't have the confidence you need to be able to do what you want. Right. The other advantage is the more you understand the material and how it works together, the more creative you can be because you can, you can certainly alter the way it looks in terms of texture and color and things like that, marbling and veining and all that stuff. But you can also start being creative with your designs. Are you making a chair or a table or like, uh, a couple days ago, somebody posted a picture of he had like a a a, a chair with like a, a concrete chair, and that the legs, the, the the arms and the legs were wood, and it looked cool. But the the chair itself was a lot thicker than I thought it needed to be. Like it was inch and a quarter thick, or it looked really clunky. And then there was an end table that had some interesting layering in it, but the table itself was, gosh, it was like two or three inches thick all one cast piece and oh it looked pretty but man can you imagine trying to move that and as a customer would you want to have a piece of uh, furniture in your house that weighs like 300 pounds that you can't move <laughs> i mean it, it maybe i just get too focused on the practical elements of things but 
you know, think about not just me, but my customer, you know, I got a, I I'm selling this to a, a single person who lives alone and they got to move it around because they got to clean their house. So they want to rearrange their furniture and it's too heavy for them to move. You know, is that, does that make sense to make a piece of furniture that weighs so much that two people can barely move it? Um, it looks nice and maybe that's all that matters, right? Uh, maybe I'm being pedantic here, but you know, get, getting, getting back, like think about what you're making. If I'm making wall panels or floor tiles or whatever, or just a, a, a thin like backsplash, I'm pouring, you know, probably half inch thick, three quarter inch thick, somewhere in there, weigh my hands thin, right? It's a big open pan. The form is flat. There are how many different ways can you cast that? Do you really need to have something that has an ultra high compressive strength, for instance, for that particular piece? And if I'm making, let's, you know, I made in in the the um, CCI the old CCI classroom, I I'd cast a we had a working kitchen and I had cast a backsplash and the the wall that it was put on was kind of uneven, so I cast this five or six foot long backsplash. It was probably about that high ish, pretty thin, thin enough that I could flex. So I literally just glued it to the wall and I pushed it and it stayed. So I needed a piece of concrete that was thin so I could flex it, but I also didn't want it to crack. So that's where I need a very high flexural strength material. Well, what makes materials, what gives concrete a high flexural strength? The right kind of fibers. And I want to, I'm going to play you two, two different videos. And this, these are videos of, uh, from my test program. Some of these were taken last year and all that. Um, actually, I have four, but I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to show you all four. Two, two of these come from two ultra UHPC mix designs. So they're taken from technical journals. So these are real, honest to goodness, real world UHPC mixes made as close as possible to the actual real thing. But I'm not using steel fibers because nobody wants to work with steel fibers. I'm using PVA fibers. So I'm using PVA 100s or 12 millimeter long fibers. And um, this first one uses a 1.1% load of PVA fibers. And again, to define that, that includes the weight of the water, because when you make concrete, you put water in it. That's how GFRC, that's how you dose fibers. You don't dose it based on just dry ingredients. You dose it based on everything. So if, if you didn't include the water, it would be a higher percentage than 1.1%. But this is what 1.1%. And it's 28 day flexural strength was 2,149 PSI, 2,150. So a nice high flexural strength load. So I'm gonna share my screen with that. So this is near as much an absolute, let's see, this is 0822, this one. So before I just turn off, this because this is a fan in the background. Um, sure, yeah. Oop, sorry. My bad. Okay. So what you're seeing here is stop. A piece of GFRC. I'm gonna pause. There we go. Okay. In my test program, I make these essentially tiles, right? This is roughly um, five eighths of an inch thick, roughly sixteen millimeters thick. Of course, I measure the thickness extremely precisely. And looking at the, you know, and this is a traditional area, UHPC mix, correct? This is a UHPC mix. This is a real, real world UHPC. 
piece. Of, I'm not calling it that because I, I want to impress people. It's this is what it's from a technical paper. Mm -hmm. And it uses 1.1% PVA, PVA 100 fiber load. Uh, the water cement ratio of this was 0.24. And there you can see the, the relatively low volume of air voids in it. Um, see the surface quality of it. Uh, pretty darn good. There's no pinholes in it. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is a two inch wide sample. It's 14 inches long. Um, test program center to center on the top is 12 inches. Center to center on the bottom is exactly four inches. So everything's very, very precise, even though it doesn't look like it is. It is. What I'm going to do is just play a short segment. I'm pushing down mm -hmm. from the top. So I'm flexing this upward. So it should make mm -hmm. the concrete should should form a frown. You know, it should be like an arc where it's mm -hmm. pointing up. I'm just going to run this by hand. And the numbers at the bottom are the the force in pounds pushing down. And you multiply that by four because of the way my machine's made. So, you know, numbers like this, when I hit 30, that's really 120 pounds being pushed on this thing. And it gets up to about 40 something. Now, watch watch its behavior right now. So load increases. Is it bending? I want to see how fast that happens. Can you can you play, yeah, I'm just gonna the, play the video? Yeah, this hang on. Fascinating. I, got, I got something in my way. Yeah, you right, so it's just, stop sharing. It's just anyway. running. This is real real time, not sped up. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. It's good. It's good. It's good. Oh, it's broken. Well, there was That's no bending there. It failure. Just, just cracked. Just cracked. It just cracked. That's called a brittle failure. I'll do that again. It's not sped up. Pop. It's just boom. Instant. It even snaps. So this is a very high loading of PVA fibers in a very high compressive strength concrete. And this is 28 day strength now. So again, I'll play it again. Bam, fast. That's the characteristic, that's the property of UHPC with PVA fibers. Now, if I use steel fibers, it would be different, but we don't work with steel fibers. Oops, uh, oh, hang on, sorry about that. Um, now, I'm going to share my screen with, this is the, this is CCI new GFRC. Now this, this is, um, I know I'm not sharing it yet. I will be in a second. This is what's called um, a more ductile or not brittle. So this is new GFRC. This is new GF. So this is with uh, this is a three percent fiber load. So this is a very high fiber load um, of nineteen millimeter glass fibers, and uh, the the sample thickness is a little different. So you you can't correlate the numbers exactly because thickness makes a huge you know you deal Even with dealing with thickness differences. It's, it's not like a yeah small changes in thickness have a massive difference in in um in the flexural strength of the material. So this is a seven-day strength, not a 28-day strength. This is a seven-day strength. Um, it's a higher water cement ratio. This is a 0.3 water cement ratio. So the other one was a 0.24. This is a 0.3. This is only seven-day strength, not 28-day strength. So you would think, okay, it's younger. It's got more water. And what are the rules of water cement ratios, right? Higher water content, bad. Um, and this is... This is uh, the, I'll call it the, the alpha GFRC mix, not a UHPC mix. Its seven-day flexural strength is 2,466 PSI. So almost 300, more than 300 PSI greater. I'm going to play it. So it's a, it's a little slow. I'm going to speed it up a little bit. But, okay, what happened there is... Yeah, it's got a little vo more voids in, in it, but the casting surface is pretty flawless. And there's a point... Well, and remember, happens... this is at 3% fiber, so you, right know, you, there. you can't compare that with something that's 1.75% uh, fibers. Correct. You guys probably can't see it, but 
I can see it. That's kind of the across, first yeah. little hairline crack that formed. So that's it's called limit of rupture. And that's that's the strength that we care about. Mm -hmm. Now this is a thicker sample, so it's I mean, a th this is a thinner sample. I'm, I'm zoomed in a little closer. Um, so it's it's the the again the numbers are 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 different. You can't compare. Well, the other one broke at 35. This is broken at uh, first crack at 36. But even if even if they were identical, this gets its first crack that's maybe visible. I mean, can you see that? Mm -mm. Now watch what happens. So it's already cracked. Look at the load, all right? It'll go up and down a little bit as the concrete engages the fibers differentially. And this is what you want to have happen. That is crazy. So, so it just it's went down keep again going up. back up. Now that crack's a little bit more visible. Mm -hmm. And then when, when you relax it, you can't see it anymore. It's going up. You might see more cracks happen. We're close to failure, but we're not at failure. This is the kind of behavior GFRC oh, gives you. another one. Yep. Progressive so cracking. Fascinating. Right, see and how the load goes going up. up and then down and then yep. up and then as down. As more as fibers, fibers get reengaged. Yeah. And then there's going to be a point where it just can't take it. But it, 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 it kind of slowly. Yeah. It's a progressive. Yeah. So the, the, there's obviously some big cracks and it's going to fail now. Mm-hmm. There it goes. There it goes. But see how slow that was compared to the just snap? Right. Whee! Whee! We're back. <laughs> um, but that's the different behavior between, again, going to the strict definition, glass fiber reinforced ultra high perf performance concrete. So. G F R U H P C say that 12 times mm -hmm. fast. That's what we make. That's what CCI makes and teaches. Not brittle PVA reinforced concrete that looks fine and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. Um and again, you know, we've we've said this a bunch of times, but the fiber load matters. That was a 3%, which is, you 3%. Know, if you were to go down to a 1.75%, which again is something that's happening, um, it would fail a lot more brittly and a lot quicker. It's going to look a lot more like the UHBC PVA sample. fiber one. I have another video that uses a 1.4% PVA fiber load. Now, this is interesting. And so the video you saw with a 1.1% PVA fiber load had a flexural strength of 2149 psi mm -hmm. 2150 that's really good at 28 days really good don't get me wrong but it's brittle i have another test that uses a 1.4 percent pva fiber load so higher more fibers more is better right everybody knows that right well its flexural strength at 28 days was, was 1960 so 200 PSI less. So you think, I'm going to put more fibers in it, but I get less strength. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that when you start adding more and more fibers, you start trapping more voids in the concrete. Mm -hmm. And as you trap more voids in the concrete, those air bubbles displace the stuff that gives it strength. So it's like a sponge. A sponge is relatively That's weak. kind of a double-edged sword, isn't it? It's a double-edged sword. And what I've seen from some other folks who are advocating using very low fiber loads because they want high density, you know, it's all about density and high flow. But what they're doing is they're sacrificing strength. You get a very brittle concrete. Sure, it's dense, great, wonderful. But if your piece shatters in half because you picked it up wrong or you looked at it wrong, or it accidentally fell, you know, a couple inches and it shattered like glass, is that really doing you any favors? Is that really the kind of product that you want to be basing your business on? Now, does that mean you can't take that concrete and make it correctly? It's not the concrete's fault. It's the fact that 
you're doing it wrong. Well, and and not it's, that it's you're doing it wrong. You're you know it's it's more of you're doing it. That's with, a little harsh. Right? Yeah, well, you're doing it with misinformation, right? Because if you're being told that something like that can do something it's not really designed for, then you're, 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 you're not, not making bendable concrete. You're not making flexible concrete a low fiber load. It would be and, like if I if I sat here and told you, hey, go make a traditional non reinforced sand mix. Um, precast and do it at three quarters thick and just carry it however because it'll be fine no it won't it'll break yeah but i but you but you made it right based on mm -hmm. my recommendation yeah so and, and, and so another really, i'm the one who's context. telling you wrong not not the other way around so. and, and another element of context that that we want to bring into this is you could you could take an all sand mix Two parts sand, one part cement, add some water, pack it in to your form, three quarter inch thick. I could make a one foot wide by one foot long tile. I can pick that up all day long, right? It'll work. It's fine. Make it two foot long. Okay, I could do that. Make it three foot long. Mm -hmm. I got to start thinking about handling it a little bit more carefully. Mm -hmm. Make it five feet long. Am I going to be successful? There she is. <laughs> and there he is. Um, what if I, I want to make an eight foot long countertop out of that? All my stuff. What are the, you know, what are the, the chances of Concrete me being successful with that? Very, very low. Okay. So you just can't take something in a small context right. that's successful at say a short length i only make four foot vanities or five foot vanities or nowadays eight foot is not really that big mm -hmm. right but if if what you're taught is good up to say eight foot long and then you decide i want to make something 16 feet long it may not work right. because the greater context of structural design and the behaviors, the physics of things mm -hmm. bending and what's right. actually important. That's the element that I want to convey. And it's, it's a complex element. There's a lot, a lot going into it. And, um, meet Holland, by the way. Hey, everybody meet Holland. The Didn't newest member of the CCI family. That's right. He's chewing on his hand right now. So when's he going to be ready to grout? <laughs> <laughs> Give them a couple of weeks, right? That's what a lot of a lot of uh, students have their kids start. Yeah, I need to, I need to get my kids in this in the, my other kids in the shop to to do that. He's not yeah. quite ready yet. But Just my, make sure but, they wear gloves and do proper, you know, safety things. But, but my my, my, uh, my twin boys are uh, almost. They'll be seven uh, next month. Yeah, pretty soon. And uh, so they can they can get in I started, grout, right? I started cooking when I was seven. I started. I shouldn't say this. I started driving when I was six. <laughs> golf carts guys <laughs> but i did i think I, I started driving my grandfather's van uh, in the neighborhood when i was like 11 my mom didn't nice. know about it until i was 15 yeah us, us old timers used to do that and it was okay <laughs> um so you know again folding back what's the difference between gfrc uhpc when do i choose one is one better than the other i think if I had to like wrap all this up into a nice neat package is the modern concrete that, that a lot of folks are using, although it may not strictly meet the definitions of UHPC by, which is, there, there are a variety of them. Um, but one of them is, you know, a compressive strength that's 22,000 PSI or, or, or anything like that. Um, it may not meet that, but compressive strength is not the the type of strength that we need that we rely on. It's an it's certainly a nice thing to be able to. It's a bragging. It's a point of bragging. Oh yeah, my strength, my compressive strength is such and such because that's that's the vocabulary, that's the language people talk about concrete in, but. It's not really that relevant. It's flexural strength. It's his bending strength. It's my ruler. Get my ruler. It's the bending strength. It, you know, if I'm making a, a, a planter 
or like that that vanity you made that has 16 inch tall sides mm -hmm. flexure strength is irrelevant for right. that because it doesn't flex but so is compressive strength now you just need good concrete that's easy to work with mm -hmm. so you have a little bit more latitude so if i know how to make something that gives me high flexural strength because that's the thing that matters when i'm picking up a slab i can also do anything else i want right right but if i don't know how to make something that has high flexural strength if all I know how to do is use a mix that has a high compressive strength, that could let me down when I'm not expecting it. Yeah, and so again, the the idea here is teach 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 a man to fish. Um, you know, the idea is if you grasp the concepts of your you know materials and the the chemistries behind them, and you know, if you're not just taught this bag does what you you need right um then you can you can expand your horizons yeah so. and to kind of follow on that so as a fiber reinforcement i like glass fibers they give me fantastic performance i can control my mix to get very high flow we've already seen that last week um <clears throat> and you just saw the the, the visual physical evidence that glass fiber reinforced UHPC, if you will, gives better performance than will. PVA reinforced UHPC. I mean, it's shocking. Um, if I need a high flexural strength, I will never, ever, ever, ever use PVA fibers because they do not perform. Um, Which again is something that we did not expect to see when we started testing yeah, this. I saw that because again, you, you see these pictures. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this picture of you know, everybody sees, the, I know you can't see it yet, but you will. Everybody sees this, and this is PVA re reinforced concrete, so it must be strong. Look at that, it's bending, so I'm going to do that. That's the narrative that we've all been kind of following. And we've kind of ignored the fact that this is full of cracks. And our customers won't buy that. And the other thing we don't know is, well, what is it? What is actually, you know, that's a very flexible piece of concrete. But I don't want my big dining room table to flex like that. How do I, how do I keep it from doing that? So it's not just the concrete. It's not just the fibers. It's more than that. And that's leading on to another topic that I want to cover in another podcast. Oops. So the, the excited and, and kind of, so I like glass fibers. I'm going to teach with glass fibers. Can you still use PVA fibers for, sure. for times that you don't need flexural strength? Absolutely. Go for it. Great. They're a lot more expensive. And if you grind the concrete, they get fuzzy and it's, some people don't like them. Some people don't care. Some people love them. Right. But don't rely on them for high flexural strength. Right. As for the concrete, Right. I don't teach with a liquid polymer anymore. I, a lot of people know I've created my own curing polymer. We've talked about the importance of curing polymer. There's a technical report that I just found. I was going to share it with you guys. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to bore you with it. That states that in UHPC, if you do not cure your concrete correctly, you do not get the strengths you expect. And a lot of commercial UHPC has to be wet cured for a long time. And when they're doing those tests to get those high strengths, they're curing it for 28 days. We can't afford that kind of time. Not overnight under plastic. Now, they might do heat curing in this one document, this one test program. They looked at taking the same exact mix and they cured it three different ways. And one of them was an intermediate way. but one was we cure it at room temperature, happened to be 68 degrees or 20 degrees centigrade um, overnight. You cure it under the plastic and then demold it the next day, um, just like we do. And then it just cured at, at room temperature in a humid environment for 28 days. So that's the different part is they cured it in a humid environment for 28 days, but it was at room temperature. It never achieved that high strength that we think of as UHPC. 
the only way they got there was to steam cure it for 48 hours. So two straight days at, one was at 60 degrees centigrade, which is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. The other was at 90 degrees centigrade, which is like, I don't know, 190 degrees Fahrenheit. So they have to heat it. For two solid days, for 48 straight hours, neither of which is practical for us to do. That's how you get those high strengths with UHPC. So if you're, I guess really what we're at, what we're saying here is if you're being told, hey, you know, here's something that doesn't have, you know, this drawback or this drawback, and you can get away with just curing it the way that you would with normal GFRC, but it doesn't have certain ingredients in it, like that may or may not be true. And and you need to try it for yourself. Um, you know, it's like, I think, Jeff, you posted on uh, when we did our last podcast, it was like experiment with mm-hmm. your stuff. You know, I'm not just, we're not trying to like, oh, take my word for it. It's the best or no, test it, you know? <laughs> um, you know, mix design. Come see it in person in November and December. Yeah. It's a complex topic. And, and I keep coming back to this, but then I get distracted. Uh, we we kind of have a big announcement like the new oh that's right Alpha the... Pro Admix. It's in transit it's on its way to the warehouse right now, so it's very very soon going to be up on the website, and there'll be a description of it. There's some pretty great numbers. What it does, like some of the test data that that you've I've been talking about, some of the videos you've seen are with it. So it, it, yes, it has a curing polymer in it. And yes, it needs it because that's how I get, that's how I get such high early strengths. And that's how my seven day strength, my seven day strength with Alpha Pro Admix exceeds other UHPC mixes that don't have polymer. In. Their 28 day strength is lower than my seven day strength. And their seven day strength is lower than my one day strength. Well, and and it's worth noting that often those types of mixes, their strength goes down at twenty eight days yeah. because of the because they of dry the lack out. Of polymer. And you get shrink it, you know, flex, flexing. Whenever you flex something, you're creating tension in it. Tension's in the bottom. Tension is extremely tensile strength is extremely sensitive to micro stresses in the matrix, drying shrinkage creates a lot, you know, your concrete drying out creates a lot of problems, a lot of micro stresses in the concrete. And that's like a precursor to a, to a crack. If you don't have polymers in your concrete and it's not cured properly, you, you could be setting yourself to, up to have a lot of weaknesses. You know, the stone industry, if, you know, I don't know, maybe some of you are familiar with the stone industry, like granite countertops and things like that. I used to work with a lot of guys in the stone industry, where I was with the uh, Surface Fabricators Association, it's now ISFA, which is a different acronym. They focus more on solid surface, but the stone industry used to be part of that. Um, natural stone has fissures in it, has weak points in it. It's a very, very, very brittle material. And because it might have a micro fissure in it or a micro crack or just a, a natural seam, that they could pick up a slab and it snaps. Just like that, just like that UHPC sample that I showed you. It looks great. It looks great. It looks great. And then it's in two pieces Mm -hmm. and then it doesn't. So micro stresses in your concrete from drying shrinkage or improper curing or mix design that allows those to happen um, can cause you a lot of problems and cost you a lot of money because all of a sudden you have a piece that shatters or you're, you're installing it correctly and then it just snaps in half when it shouldn't um, because the mix never gets as strong as you think it does. Right. And, you know, fold that into using PVA fibers instead of glass fibers. Now you have a, a very brittle, weak material that's ready to break on you and you don't even know it. Um, it might feel hard. And this is something I, I brought up. I mentioned casually before. Just because something is hard doesn't mean it's strong. That's a big misconception. Um, an egg. Sounds pretty good, right? An eggshell is hard, but it's not very strong. 
Hardness does not mean strength. So don't think that that's a good test. It's a rough, you know, there's the Schmidt hammer, which is a very rough empirical correlation to relative strength, but it's, it's inferring strength based on other properties. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't tell the full picture. It's not an accurate description. Um, very hard things tend to be very brittle, and it takes a lot to undo that. And right. you just saw visually, you know, UHPC is very, very hard. It's also very brittle. Mm -hmm. um, it can be strong when it's cured properly. But if it's not, you never get that strength, but it still feels hard. Yeah. And and that's that's something that the reason why we're talking about this so much is is we're trying to undo a lot of these misconceptions that a lot of people don't talk about. Like there are lots of folks who are making concrete all over the world. And it's very exciting. Like I've taught a lot of them. Other people have taught a lot of them. Or some of them, I should say. Not as many as I have, but a lot of people. And when you get on an internet forum or Facebook group or whatever, or you're sharing your things on Instagram or, or talking on a podcast, it's human nature to talk about your successes. So there's a lot of positive bias. Right. Very few times do you hear about people's problems or failures. Because especially if you're, you know, it's human nature to want to share what you're doing and be part of a group and be part of a community and get that support. But if you're not really, truly close with people and you don't really know who they are, you're really going to be a little bit hesitant to air your dirty laundry, so to speak, mm -hmm. because what could happen? You get somebody who's, who starts vilifying you, criticizing you, demonizing you because you did something that doesn't follow the local narrative. And so everybody's like, yeah, yeah, it's great. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread, even though it's great some of the time and it's not. This happens with, with sealers a lot. This happens with mix designs. It's, this happens with casting techniques. This happens with reinforcing. It happens a lot. With, with a lot of things and it, it's not just limited to concrete you know right the baking industry the car industry the paint industry the knitting industry whatever everybody has the, the same kind of bias so you can't just go online and and wow everybody's talking great about this thing it must be beautiful and there must not be any problems that's not an accurate way to interpret things People aren't going to say, well, I use this stuff and everybody says it's great, but I didn't have a good result with it. Now that one person's the, the black oh, sheep, the scapegoat, because, oh, it must be you. Oh, well, maybe, maybe it's not me. Maybe it's the stuff. Or maybe I used it wrong because I was told to do it wrong well, for whatever reason, right? So just be careful. Just take things with a slice of bread and, and use a, a little of bit of crit. What's that? Grain of salt. Grain of salt. What did I say? Take things with a slice of bread. Slice That's a new bread. one. I am really excited about. <laughs> so I have this. I have this text. I'm just going to tell you this right now. I have this text group with a couple of friends, and we uh, we often send back and forth um, misused midi uh, idioms, uh, malifors, if you will. Um, and so, like uh, six in a dozen is a good one. Um, yeah. uh, mess with the bull, you get a China, get the china shop. Also a great one. Mm -hmm. And now take that with a slice of bread. <laughs> take that with a slice of bread. I love that so much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Um, so like, the, the, again, just to go back, the, the, the new Alpha Pro admixture has a, has alpha polymer in it. We already talked about that. Has, and which has our extremely powerful defoamer in it. So you're going to get very, very good surface quality. And, it has a cocktail of very, reactive very pozzolans. reactive po uh, pozzolans to give very high early strengths, very good performance, very dense concrete, um, all the things you want. Like it, you as artisans, we want you to understand it, but on a practical day-to-day -day level you don't need to know what's in the mix as long as you can rely on it as long as you can trust it 
you know, all the, a lot of what we're talking about is so that we can build a, a sense of trust and to, for you to know that, hey, we're not just making up stuff and making up our own rules because it suits our narrative. It's, this is, you know, we're basing things, I'm basing things on real principles drawn from the larger global professional technical community. Um, well, it's like if I'm building a, if I'm building is, a motor, if I'm building a motor, I'm not going to oversize two of the cylinders and undersize three of the cylinders. And then just because I feel like if I oversize two cylinders and on, and, and put, uh, you know, maybe we turbocharge three of the cylinders. Right. Based on what? Yeah. Right. Um, and, and so that's, that's where it's like, no, we're going to build a motor based on the principles of building a motor that we know to be true, not some new, fa you know, new mm -hmm. maybe, maybe narrative. It's going to be, yeah. you know, these are based on, you know, Ferrari is still using internal combustion technology from 70 years ago in principle. Well, but, you know, more than 70 years ago in yeah, principle, but it's but, refined. But it's refined. And so, you know, it's like you can't, you can't say that the Ferrari V10 of 2023 is the same as the Ferrari V8 of 1953. Right. You can't. Although it has the same basic, of has a crankshaft, has pistons, it has valves. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. way they're put together and the science behind it is very, very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, again, we, we, I feel like lately we exist to pull the curtain back. Um, and, well, and that, it's a that's lot of kind fun. of what I've been doing for a long, long time. Long time, and it's a lot of fun to be honest with you. Uh, I'm having, I'm having a great time, um, and I hope y'all are too. So uh, we've gone an hour and thirty seven minutes. So we yep. probably ought to uh, time to wrap this time up. Time to wrap it up. But um, if you want to pull the curtain back with us um, in November 9th and tenth, we only have a couple spots left. So um, it's, it's, you know, if you want to come definitely sign up quickly because those spots have, have gone very quickly. We'll be um, absolutely using the new ad mixture. Oh, I'm super excited. Um, and then uh, December 4th through 8th, the ultimate uh, craft concrete workshop um, is also quite near full. So, um, Hurry so up. you know, don't, don't, don't delay. Join us uh, and, and we'll pull back the curtain with you, not for you, mm -hmm. with you. Um, so yeah, I uh, hope you've enjoyed this. Very, very fun conversation. I certainly did. Um, and we'll see you, see you next week. Looking forward to it. Bye, everybody. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Maker in the Mix podcast. If you liked the content and want to hear more, please like and subscribe. Uh, feel free to follow us on YouTube as well as Instagram, Facebook, and check out the website, www.concretecountertopinstitute.com. And of course, we'd love to see you at one of our upcoming classes. Tune in next week for more informative content. Thanks.